Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're honored to be joined by Aaron Dworkin to discuss his collections of poems called The Poet Journalist, which is Grammy nominated for Best Spoken Word Poetry Album. So, Aaron, great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. I, I listened to your album and just called you up and I said, you know, we need to we need to do this. Oh, no, absolutely. And it's it's great to be here with you and, and under Grammy consideration at this point. So which is what we're, we're under Grammy consideration. I stand corrected. But my word, you know, I, I was listening to the the work that you were doing and the topics that you cover. So rather than me talk about it, talk about how you put this album together, the, the selection of topics. And it goes from very heartfelt and very personal to topics of societal uh, change and and conflict, um, all sorts of different, you know, very micro, very macro. How did you put this together? Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's kind of the culmination of a number of things. So of course, right, I've done my spoken word for years, and I've often combined it with music. And several years ago, I was looking at kind of wanting to, to really delve into a new significant project in this medium. But in doing that, I really actually wanted to focus on doing things a cappella, not necessarily with music this time, um, but really delving into kind of several of these key issues that are facing society and was thinking about that and almost kind of got in my head. It's basically kind of journalism, but I'm doing it as poetry. And that led me to this poet journalism. That's what I really want to try to do and figured it was a thing and tried to look it up and it wasn't a thing. Um, and so I was like, even better, I can really kind of create a space here. And so that really got me thinking, how can I use now this medium to creatively illustrate, explore, delve into, but not just news events, but issues that surround our society and or that we've experienced in, in history. And so that led to kind of this idea of poet journalism book, and of course, now the album. As part of that process, I didn't want to just kind of say, okay, let me delve in, dive into these things, and without kind of really any other input, kind of develop my own poetry and then usually have, you know, relatively few people read it, maybe in academic settings and, you know, appreciate it or critique it. And that's kind of where it is. I wanted the poetry to be able to really come from and be a call and response and reflect conversations, communications, experiences in these variety of different aspects and issues. So that led me to think kind of almost as an entrepreneur, how do I do that? And so I was like partnerships. And so that's when I began to reach out to institutions that I felt had um, purposes, had intent that was in alignment with things I was hoping to capture. Um, health inequality. So I ended up developing a partnership with the Rodham Institute or obviously the arts, so Ovation TV or Charm Music, um, obviously African-American history. So the Wright Museum of African-American history, um, uh, dance and especially diversity in dance. So complexions, contemporary ballet. And so, you know, this kind of then began to develop into this host of partnerships and including those who want to have impact on community like the Fisher Foundation. Um, and so what happened is that then those organizations ended up really sharing framing with me of, well, we'd like a poem with this particular framing, this bent, so on and so forth. So a significant percentage of the poems you'll hear on the album are generated from that. So with that kind of, if you will, is the components of the toolkit then it was kind of, well, what do I want to say? Where do I kind of want to speak? And so one of the areas on the album is hidden history. Um, and that's obviously dealing with African-American um, history, Black American history, um, specifically uh, poems like about the Green Book um, or about Tuskegee, things like that, even a poem about Obama. Um, music obviously has played a huge role in my life and I continue to be immersed in it. And so there's a section kind of on artful um, and it kind of brings some of that context about the arts and its role in our society, in corporations, even in, uh, to bear. Um, 
women obviously have played such a huge role in my life, whether in partnership or from the perspective of mothers or from the perspective of daughters, et cetera. And so there's a number of poems that kind of coalesce through um, that, including very personal. So some of the poems are are autobiographical and uh, a poem relating to Afa, my wife's mo- uh, mother, and, um, and kind of those interactions and what I felt I learned um, about uh, love and life from her. Um, uh, and then also just history and how we um, celebrate and understand different identities. And so there's poems in there that uh, reflect um, celebrations of, um, of both religious and or gender um, and or historical identities. Um, and then a really critically important component is mental health. Uh, this issue that's been critically important to me uh, for my entire life and and part of the numerous challenges that I've encountered in life, including include some mental health challenges. And so I um, have a, a host of poems that kind of coalesce around that and those experiences, um, including fear um, and fear of loss when we lose people uh, through death and also fear of health concerns. There's a poem called The Waiting Room and uh, that moment that any of us who have been in a waiting room waiting for what could potentially be um, very tragic news, how that, how you experience that um, and how you relate to others as you do, um, and childhood uh, and kind of reflections on on that. So the the poems that come out through the album really cut across a wide swath of experiences and areas um, but they all kind of emanate from this idea of the role that I'm trying to fulfill as a poet journalist. And that is, of course, the title poem, The Poet Journalist, which hopefully captures all of that. Could you read The Poet Journalist for us? Sure. Absolutely. Um, I know a performer ne- hates to perform, but... Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so this is the poet journalist, and again, I drafted it um, uh, originally not to be, if you will, the title poem uh, of a collection, but to help even give me framing for what I wanted to do and what I wanted to say and the role that I wanted to play. So I thought I'd try and capture it through a number of different key historical experiences that I experienced in the news, our, our traditional news journalism sphere, but felt like um, that um, format wasn't able to convey everything from those experiences that we all went through and shared. So removed, it's, isn't it? It's sorry. Too removed. The way the way news is generally conveyed is too removed. It's too sanitized. Yes. And so uh, very interesting that you say that. So one of the um, themes in this is that I, the, the, if you will, the narrator of these things, am in it. You are literally part of it. Um, so uh, it's called The Poet Journalist. I am the multicolored tubes looping down the wall, darting around outlets colored red and yellow, snaking into veins of the elderly woman, gasping from within the sheets of her COVID bed, anchored by technology to the protocols of strangers dedicated to prolong the life she faces without the grip on her lover's wrist. I am the passive man in straight black pants with my untucked white shirt facing the column of tanks as their turrets salute my defiance in Tiananmen Square before my movement falters, showcasing my human right to exist, my freedom to persist. I am the failed bank 
filled with the empty paper and promises of people's dreams, chosen for their inability to pay like the stray gazelle on the savannah as the lion poaches their prey in the early morning mist. I am the Twin Towers twisted metal, exploding into crimson blossoms, fading into black entrails and futures lost, shading the horizon of our lives like the passions of lovers before they fall into disarray and forget what sparked their rise and hatred of their demise and events regretted yet still reminisce. I am the nine minutes and 29 seconds that a black man donning a black tank top felt the knee of dispassionate authority on his full-throated neck before his life with voice was ground into silence that was heard and shook the sugar maple trees of Richmond, Virginia and broke the blue wall more than any Afro pick with fists. I am the grist for bottled water office talk. I assist the memory to feel the moments lost. I am the emotion of every story missed. I am the words the newsprint failed to list. I am our soul we must enlist. I am the poet journalist. It's a very affecting piece, and what you're doing to me, to the to to one listener, is you're creating a relationship between the reporter and the person who is and the people who are being reported upon. And you're basically, to me, again, this is just my listening. You're 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 saying that. We are the person, the people um, who are reporting upon, and the 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 identities that we have of gender, of race, of age, of of nationality, of language, and so on. That those those can be fluidly uh, transported, so that you can inhabit the body of somebody standing in front of tanks or somebody who is uh, dying in her COVID bed, right? Exactly. I mean, and, oh yeah, no, it's so, so much the case. And, and, and obviously with, with traditional journalism where, you know, really one should not, you know, be part of the story. And, and I understand that intent of observation. And then I take that kind of, and I feel one step further with photo journalists where, right, if the will that photo a thousand words, and now you can visualize what's actually you can see still as an observation. And I feel that with poet journalism, you can for a brief moment, instead of reading about the impacts of COVID, instead of maybe seeing a photo or video of someone that hopefully through this creative illustration for a brief moment, you are there, you are hooked up to the Ivy line, you are hooked up to the outlets on the wall and you are gazing at them and you're feeling it and or you're feeling that loss of a loved one so that the story takes on a different context and that's what i love about the media my hope is five ten years from now there's thousands or tens of thousands of poet journalists um because i feel like it just adds a dimension absolutely of course doesn't replace photojournalism or traditional journalism but um, it, um, I feel, adds a dimension that could hopefully help with kind of just the context and nature of where we are as a world right now. I feel the more we can utilize the arts to help create these shared experiences, um, the we, we won't solve our issues, but we could hopefully change the dynamic of the divisiveness that we are all experiencing. Well, I look at some of the um, journalists who I admire, Judy Woodruff, Glenn Eiffel, uh, Aisha Roscoe, um, uh, just to name three, all women happen to be. But 
to me, I, I, I think that the way they report does not create a tension between objectivity and personal involvement. Um, Christian Amanpour is another. Yeah, is another I was. Thing. You just took the words right out of my mouth. I was just going to mention her. Yeah. Right. So, so what you, what you're basically exploring through your art is journalism from an artistic lens, um, not in a thirty second piece that ends up getting broadcast, but in a larger uh, piece that allows you to shape words. So, talk a little bit about the performance choices that you have because you're a musician. As you said, you could have done this to background music. You could have performed your own um, uh, music, but you decided to speak your words in that delivery that you had, which to me, listening, I, I don't see you. I don't see the the background. All I hear is blackness. And and as a matter of fact, the art, the artistic uh, choices that you made to have you in a in a colorful. Um, uh, 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 a photo full of color, but the black round, the black in the background seems that seems to be the appropriate repository for your words because they go into this 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 blackness, and then they're followed by other words, and then eventually a period comes and it's followed by another sentence. Talk a little bit about your choices of how you presented this on your album. Yeah, so uh, so there are a number of components. So first, certainly because, um, and those watching may not know, so originally I'm a trained violinist since the age of five. So um, it would be impossible for me to draft, create, compose poetry uh, without having my musical background be part of that. So there is certainly, and as one as most people hear pretty quickly, rhythm, meter, um, uh, and then a intentional asymmetric asymmetry in a number of ways, asymmetrical rhyme things. Pauses. Like that. The most important note is the rest, right? Right, and exactly. And so, just like music, um, as I recite the poetry, and even in my composition of it, sometimes, not always, but but many times, I'm composing not just the 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 words themselves, but I am hearing them and or saying them as I'm writing, um, and especially during the editing process. And um, and the silence between words and or the arc, that goes between words of articulation. Um, I am experiencing and seeing and, and thinking of musical markings. I'm experiencing rests, as you said, fermatas, various intense accents on notes, not as an accent in language, but a musical accent, phrasing, of course, um, and crescendo, decrescendo, dynamics, so on and so forth. So. All of these things are part of the composition. But what I love about poetry is for my delivery, I am thinking all of those things. And for me, it's a critically important part of the poem and part of its context and meaning and different meaning. Of course, the way you say something could completely change its meaning. However, I love that some people will only experience my poetry either written um, if they aren't hearing the album or they hear the album, but then they go and they read one of the particular poems and they find something else in it. Um, there's a number of times people have said to me, oh, when I've recited a poem, they've been there, they're like, I want to hear it again. Or I want it because there were certain things that I was like, oh, wait, so what I feel like there was more meaning there, but I didn't get. And so I love that each work stands as something that a, an, an audience member can go back and explore themselves in addition to experiencing it with me in terms of a live recitation. So much of your work brings so many themes, many of which involves identity and race and, and those kinds of issues. Let me ask you a question. If, if I watch a performance um, of King Lear, and it's done by a high school uh, uh, theater group. Doesn't have the same uh, meaning as, as as if King Lear is 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 older, right? I mean, it just doesn't, right? You look at it, and you're you're looking at those magnificent words, you're hearing them, you're experiencing them. It's tough to see, you know, uh, a um, 
a 15, 16, 17 year old recite them, right? Um, how do you deal with the question of, or how do you think about the question of somebody who doesn't have your identity reciting your your poems? How do you feel about that? How, how do you think about that? How, how should I think about that? Yeah. So, well, so I have written poems, for example, um, about um, LGBTQ issues. I have written poems uh, about um, for Native American uh, uh, History Month, Indigenous people. Um, I have written um, uh, poems about aspects that are maybe only part of me and or are not necessarily part of my core identity. Um, and this is a really great question that you raise because there is certainly a number of people who, who feel like no one should ever kind of speak um, to something that they are not, i.e. Um, no one white should ever really speak to or create creative work about black people. Um, I disagree um, with that. However, um, I only disagree with the kind of carte blanche, this should just never happen kind of thing. Um, because I think especially as an artist, man, there's there's so many things uh, that we need to explore as artists. So I, I just happen to be very resistant to um, uh, kind of, uh, carte blanche statements of no one should do particular things, especially. Yeah, it's really complicated because, you, because you've got this yeah. cultural appropriation issue. I mean, we have Bradley Cooper playing Leonard Bernstein in this uh, new film, and there was this whole uh, issue about his makeup. And, and yeah, yeah. and I think I think there are some things where, you know, people and I tend not to with like social media stuff and all that. I tend not to really, you know, listen to it much. I just project out through social media. I don't really internalize much. Um, but what I would say from that is that I think it can be extraordinary. Number one, there must be authenticity. And so as long as there's authenticity, then I think it's interesting to explore these things. And like with plays or things like that, we might reimagine them. So I love when people do that and they could reimagine something where it's a young person's perspective or it's actually being projected as young people. But also I do believe that there can be value in someone's observations, someone's poet journalism of something they experience that may not be their own cultural group. Um, and in the same way that we would not expect that only people of a particular culture can go and cover news in a particular country, only black people can go and cover uh, this particular thing that's happening in, you know, Central Africa, um, but that there are people who experience things and who experience or have observations or share experiences with people from a particular culture, and now they want to share that. Um, and so in that way, while I'm not a woman, I've been able to write poetry about women um, because I'm not writing in any way, of course, saying that I know about an experience as a woman. But what I most certainly can do is share experiences that I have had with women and how I feel about that and hopefully creatively illustrate that to illustrate the women that I have experienced in my life and share that with other people. And the work that you do as an explorer, as an artist is so very important. That is the work of an artist is to test bounds, to test definitions, to test convention, right? This whole issue, it's not to invalidate the, um, the statement that there might be some cultural appropriation going on uh, but the whole idea of whether one can speak in a different voice, whether you can have a Jewish composer write an opera about um, uh, Porgy and Bess and, and then have um, roles that were written for white Europeans in England in the 1600s that are now inhabited by Latin Hispanic or, or uh, Asian Death of a Salesman, Arthur Miller's play being being performed in China. Right. I mean, that's that's the role of the artist and what you're doing 
is you're taking your humanity, you're sharing it with us, and you're drawing us in. Yeah. And also, I just want to share, too, that the, the, the idea that people who don't necessarily belong to a specific cultural background can't not only, you know, speak about their experience with those issues, but also work creatively or otherwise in the furtherance of that particular issue or group, that is vital. The number of people who were not Black, but who were involved in the civil rights movement, um, the idea that, you know, no one white should, if, if one follows that kind of um, perspective to its logical end, then no one who is white would be able to work at the NAACP or be able to work at La Raza. Or like, I mean, it just, it, it patently, A, doesn't make sense to me, but far more importantly, the work that we all want to do relating to equality, relating to injustice requires doesn't just should only be requires more than just the group who may be involved in that particular issue. We want to build partnerships and collaborations with people and that's how we bring about change. And anyone who studies major social movements of the past see that the way you achieve success when you're fighting injustice is through partnership, through collaboration, not through siloing and shutting out anyone who doesn't um, align specifically historically with the group or the issue that is um, at hand. To me, this is so important. It goes even beyond the importance of the arts and creative um, production. It goes to the way in which we can actually carry out an evolution of how we engage with one another. Critically, Every time I, I speak with you, Aaron, I come away really informed and, and thoughtful. And Warkin and your work on the poet journalist uh, up for Grammy consideration as best spoken word, the poetry album. Thank you so much again for being my teacher. I know that that's a familiar role for you, but uh, I, I, I so very much appreciate uh, your help in, in navigating these thoughts and and your work and and your poetry. Thank you so much, Mark. It was great to be able to have this conversation.